Hello and welcome back to the fourth episode of Offspring Magazine, the podcast. I'm your host, Srinath Ramkumar, and joining me today is again, Nikolai Horman. Hello, everyone. So, in this episode, we're going to continue our discussion with Dr. Peter Suber. If you haven't listened to the previous episode yet, please make sure you check it out, as we have discussed a variety of topics, including of how he started with the Open Access Initiative, and what do we plan to discuss in this episode with him, Nico? So part of this episode will be publishing models. So, for example, there's the uh, gold standard uh, of open access publishing, which is called gold open access. And journals that have this uh, model, they just publish every article accessible for everyone for free. Another type of uh, open access is the green open access. And this is actually about repositories. So basically, um, repositories make everything that is uploaded to them uh, freely accessible. And you can basically upload things like the preprint or some other article version to that, which other people then can access. Then uh, one thing that many journals are doing nowadays is actually having a hybrid model. So on the one hand side, they have their regular articles that are behind a paywall, but then uh, authors can pay an extra fee, which is actually quite expensive sometimes. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the article is open access, but uh, only this article and not the whole journal. Okay. So these are three very different models of open access. Yes. Okay. So this actually gives us some idea about what kind of publishing model the various journals are planning to use. And we should be aware of that when we're planning to publish in these respective journals. That's right. Okay. Without any further ado, let's get on with the discussion with Dr. Suber. Another topic that I'd like to talk about is basically research evaluation, because I think uh, this whole um, like uh, movement of open access is also uh, connected to research evaluation. How um, how science uh, is being uh, basically how people can advance their careers in science. Um, because uh, one thing that uh, I have to admit, uh, I myself am still um, not so sure about is, for example, if uh, right now, let's say I have like a really good, uh, really good results, and uh, my PI tells me this could be a Nature uh, Science cell paper or whatever, and then uh, I would probably not say tell him that I would rather publish it in eLife uh, instead, because of course it counts that it is or it, it shows something i guess to people that it if it is in one of those journals so uh, what would you tell a person uh, or like me i guess in this case to or try to convince me to actually publish in uh in eLife, for example uh are you saying the other person is the pi and you're not uh yes i guess like the pi is telling me okay i can uh, this work could be published uh, in a high profile Journal, I guess, or like yeah. a prestigious journal. Usually, the PI makes that decision, mm -hmm. or if the PI has a strong preference, yes. everybody else has to go along. Yes. So it's not always a matter of uh, advice. That is, it might be better uh, for certain reasons to publish it in eLife, mm -hmm. but you won't uh, cut any ice with your PI. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, my first advice is to try it out, mm -hmm. uh, try to persuade them. Okay. Uh, but another is just to remember that even if you publish in a non-open journal. You can still make the work open. Ah, okay. uh, yes. Remember that there's green mm -hmm. open access or open access okay. through repositories, yes. not just uh, mm -hmm. open access through journals. Mm -hmm. So uh, many uh, junior faculty mm -hmm. are under pressure uh, to publish their work in high prestige journals. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's because the decision is made by somebody else, namely a senior mm -hmm. PI. Sometimes it's because the promotion and tenure committee uh, makes that an important criterion. Uh, they give you more credit. Uh, if you publish in a high prestige yes. journal than if you don't. And they give Nature and Science more credit points than uh, they give eLife, mm -hmm. even though uh, eLife is uh, now in the same category. Mm -hmm. uh, but if, no matter what pressure you feel as a young mm -hmm. researcher to publish in a non-open journal, just remember there's such a thing as green open access. 
So you can go along with that pressure. Mm -hmm. You can say, okay, I'll publish in that non-open journal, okay. but I will be careful to make sure mm -hmm. that a version of it goes open in an open repository. No, that's true. Uh, I, I, I actually have to admit I forgot about this. Yes, the like the yep. embargoes, I think I remember were like six months to a year or something like this. Uh, after. Well, we have to be careful about that too. Uh, some funders uh, permit embargoes oh, okay. uh, on green open access up to, say, six or 12 months, but they don't require embargoes mm -hmm. of six or 12 months. Mm -hmm. Some publishers require embargoes, uh, and they say you can make the same work open in a repository provided you wait a certain time. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, if your university has a rights retention policy, then they have a right to ignore that publisher request for an embargo. Mm -hmm. And as I say, oh. Harvard has this kind of policy, and we do ignore those requests for embargoes. Okay. I see. We don't ignore author requests, mm -hmm. but we do ignore publisher requests. Okay. <laughs> so if the author has some reason to want an embargo, we'll respect that. And if the author, mm -hmm. uh, if the publisher persuades the author to ask for an embargo, okay. uh, we don't even know about yes. that, but we'll respect that too. But if the publisher has a standing policy mm -hmm. that you can only make work at green open access for after 12 months, uh, our view is we're not getting permission from the publisher, so we don't need to follow that oh. uh, rule. Okay. Uh, we get uh, permission directly from the author prior to the author signing the publishing contract. Okay, I see. So it, it, it's just a matter of getting this uh, um, consent from the author first, and then it's possible to put it on green open X. So on a... it, it's not just getting the content, it's getting the rights. Oh, okay, I and see. So mm -hmm. uh, when you write something new, mm -hmm. you're the copyright holder. Oh, okay. Uh, and you mm -hmm. hold all the rights until you transfer them to somebody else, mm -hmm. like a publisher. Okay. And our policy works uh, on that principle. Mm -hmm. So we ask the authors for these rights before they transfer them to any publisher. Okay, I see. No, that, that's nice. Now, I mean, I have to admit, I heard like a different story where it was basically the other way around, where uh, a PI was actually telling me um, that he would love to publish only in open access journals because for his career, it doesn't matter anymore if he publishes uh, nature papers or not. Uh, so, uh, but the problem is he doesn't want the careers of his uh, students to be bad because of that. So I guess yes. there's like both sides to it. Yeah, yeah, that can happen too. Uh, and it's unfortunately true that junior faculty are often mm -hmm. uh, judged on the prestige of the journals in which they publish, mm -hmm. and they get more points for publishing in a high-prestige closed journal than in an mm -hmm. open journal. Uh, but even if you want to help them out that way, that is, help them with their promotion and tenure committee, help them get into a, a prestigious closed journal, uh, you can still make sure that the peer-reviewed version of the article is open access in a repository. Mm -hmm. And yeah. one way to make that easier is to get a rights retention policy at your school. Uh, by the way, even without a rights retention policy, 70% mm -hmm. or so of publishers permit green open mm -hmm. access, although they do it under terms and conditions. Oh, and sometimes that's okay. an embargo. I see. But if you want to avoid all those terms and conditions, if you want to make it green even for authors who publish in the other 30% of those journals, mm -hmm. uh, if you never want to have to ask publishers for permission, mm -hmm. uh, then a rights retention policy solves all those problems. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I think generally, uh, if I speak about my institute, for example, it seems like people are... It's like a mixed bag. There's like some people who are quite enthusiastic about open science and open access, and they actually try to make an effort to uh, do so, uh, to publish uh, in uh, like open access journals, um, and also pay attention that they upload their data and make everything accessible. But then um, this is not the case for all people. So I wanted to ask, like, what is the situ What do you think of the Max Planck Society as a whole? Does it seem to push for uh, open science and open access? Or is it just like uh, one of the other uh, institutes that tries to just do its stuff or do its research? Uh, I don't know Max Planck from the inside. I know a little about mm -hmm. it from the outside. I think of it as a leader yes. in open access. Uh, okay. It's the, uh, let's say, the host, the founding host of the Berlin Declaration on Open Access. It has the Max Planck Digital Library, which is a leader in providing open access and also providing advice to researchers about open access. Uh, it hosts these wonderful uh, open science days. Uh, it's the home of uh, Open Access 2020, uh, which is an important uh, broad initiative to advance the cause of open access. Uh, now, your question arose from the specific uh, perspective of a researcher going through promotion and tenure. And I don't know what Max Planck does there. I don't know whether they 
provide good incentives to make their work open, uh, or whether they provide bad incentives. For example, uh, giving weight to journal impact factors is a bad incentive. Uh, it steers people toward, uh, uh, generally speaking, non-open journals. Uh, some open journals have very high impact factors, but uh, impact factors discriminate against new journals. You can't even get an impact factor until you're two years old. Uh, and uh, that's right, you need two years worth of data even to compute the impact factor. Uh, so brand new journals are ineligible. Even journals one and a half years old are ineligible. And even after you're two years old, it's discretionary whether you'll get an impact factor. You have to kind of prove your worth to, the, to a private for-profit company. Uh, and uh, most of the uh, closed journals with the highest journal impact factors are uh, quite a bit older than two years. That is, they're venerable. They're very well established. Some of them are more than a century old. Uh, and the average open access journal is young. Uh, and the average uh, open access journal is much, much younger than the average high prestige uh, closed journal. And in, notice, by the way, that uh, impact factors not only discriminate against open access journals because they're younger, they also discriminate against all new journals, whether they're open or closed. So if there's some exciting new field of research like uh, COVID viruses or nanotechnology, uh, something that really had no journals until very, very recently, then these criteria discriminate against them too because they're too young to have impact factors or to have large impact factors. Uh, but by the way, uh, open access journals can play the impact factor game and win if they want to because open access increases the citations to work. Uh, to individual articles and therefore increases the citations to the journals in which they're published. And journals that have converted from subscription to open access have said this. Uh, we've noticed our citations go up and our journal impact factor has gone up with it. Nevertheless, it's a bad incentive if promotion and tenure committees give high scores or you know credit uh, to articles in high uh, impact factor journals. On the whole, uh, not in every case, but on the whole, they're uh, discouraging publication in open access journals. That's bad. That's a bad incentive. A better incentive would be to say, uh, if you want us as the promotion and tenure committee to read your journal articles and evaluate them, uh, we'll do it only if they're on deposit in the institutional repository. Ah, okay. Oh, that, we're not telling nice. you where to publish. Uh, and we're not telling mm -hmm. you what to publish. We're just saying it has to be there. Otherwise, we're not going to pay attention okay. to it. Well, that's great. And uh, I mean, the thing is, um, I mean, if coming first of all back to the comment, it's nice that uh, the Max Planck Society is being taken actually as a um, as a institution that tries to push for this. This is uh, because I think they they're trying to put some effort in there, uh, definitely. So it's not only in money, but also teaching people about it. And uh, only last year we actually had a early career researcher conference on open access. Um, okay. And then coming back to the journal impact factor, I think it's, yes, uh, it's like a basically quite one dimensional and the calculation on all of this has all uh, has a lot of issues by itself. So just um, yes. the, using this as You're a exactly simple right. metric is really difficult to uh, assess uh, research with, especially yep. as I, I was mm -hmm, sorry, you were saying I was focusing on the, uh, the problems mm -hmm. or the disincentives for making work open. But the impact factor has lots of other problems. Yes. Uh, no, among so... them, it can be gamed. Uh, you can mm -hmm. uh, drive up your impact factor if you really wanted to. Moreover, the impact factor of an article is based on mm -hmm. the citations to the whole journal, mm -hmm. not to your individual article. Mm -hmm. And your article might be dragging down the average because it's so bad. Uh, yes. Or your article <laughs> might be bringing up the yeah. average because it's so good. Mm -hmm. So, by... Moreover, finally, mm -hmm. uh, many articles are highly cited because they're bad or because they're wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, and that gives a very misleading impression mm -hmm. if we're just counting citations. Yeah. So what of kind of other metrics would you actually suggest uh, or would be would come into play uh, to evaluate research properly? I mean, yeah, I find one of the limiting factors in general is just time. Uh, I just heard actually today when I was speaking to colleagues that for one position, one PI position at an institute, uh, they got a thousand applicants so even if you're a faculty of 30 people you have to like each of them has to just review thir at least 30 people so this is like can be an endless game where you just review people yeah that's a hard problem mm -hmm. uh, i've been on uh, more than 20 searches in my career and in every case there were far too many applicants mm -hmm. uh, to treat everybody uh, with the same 
time and respect. Mm -hmm. And the way most committees solve this problem in practice is to develop short lists mm -hmm. and say, of all these hundreds of applicants, uh, which are the 20 that most deserve our attention? Mm -hmm. And you can often whittle down to a list like 20 just based on their areas of specialization. Oh, okay. uh, and maybe you can whittle down to a list of uh, five mm -hmm. uh, based on other factors. But then when you have that short oh, list, you look very, very closely mm -hmm. at everything they've done. Okay. No, I mean, okay, so basically uh, just seeing what research would fit to the institute uh, or university that they're applying to, what the other um, faculty are uh, doing in general. Okay. I see. That's right. Uh, if we're talking about academic departments hiring mm -hmm. faculty, they tend to hire people to fill a certain niche. Mm -hmm. They want people with a certain specialization. And believe it or not, they get applications from people who do not have the advertised specialization. People just oh, okay. send in their application uh, yes. as a shot in the dark mm -hmm. uh, just to see what their chances are. Yes. It's pretty easy to discard those. They might be very, very good people, but they have the wrong okay. specializations for the job. Uh, I see. So that's also kind of pushing up the um, numbers of the applications in the end. Right. Yeah, I mean, also one of the issues that is like the number of PhD students that uh, exist nowadays uh, is also a lot larger than the number of PI positions. So they were not growing in the same rate. Um, so I guess it's only normal that the, um, the spots will be scarcer uh, than before. Yes, and I'm afraid that problem will get worse. I oh, think okay. the pandemic recession will simply reduce the number of faculty positions. Uh, everywhere, uh, okay. the wealthy schools and less wealthy schools alike, mm -hmm. uh, everything is shrinking. Everything mm -hmm. uh, is taking a serious financial hit. Mm -hmm. And yet, uh, the number of students mm -hmm. who are trained to become faculty uh, will shrink more slowly. Uh, mm -hmm. There's still students in the pipeline, let's say. Yes. Uh, it may be harder to finish because of the pandemic, but once you're finished, you're competing uh, with your peers mm -hmm. for a smaller number of jobs. Yeah. Uh, that's not good. Yeah, I mean, the time scale it will take for the jobs to start picking up again compared to the uh, p uh, people finishing is not in the same. I mean, until the recession and everything will uh, be better uh, again or um, recovered, um, it will take like uh, quite a few years, I'm afraid. That's right. Now, so actually going to the funders' perspective then, do you think uh, that the, um, the funding is... Uh, um, I mean, I heard kind of that it's stagnant a bit, the scientific funding. How is it in the U.S.? Is it uh, um, like going up? Uh, well, before the, like the, NIH before the pandemic, it actually was going up a little bit. <clears throat> and that was after it had mm -hmm. gone down a little bit. So uh, it, that, was mm -hmm. a, that was some good news. Uh, on the other hand, the Trump administration has been uh, removing some open access research mm -hmm. funded by the federal government. Uh, it hasn't... It didn't uh, okay. slash research budgets uh, as much as it uh, opposed open access to mm -hmm. already published research. But uh, the funding was going up at uh, the federal research agencies until the pandemic, and I'm not sure what's going to happen now. Uh, so much mm -hmm. money has been used for economic stimulus, mm -hmm. justifiably. Uh, it leaves yes. less money for mm -hmm. other purposes, including good purposes. Almost all the other purposes are good, mm -hmm. but uh, research funding is one of them, and I It's too early to say what the outcome will be. We're supposed to have the next federal budget mm -hmm. in October. Uh, we almost never succeed in oh, okay. reaching the deadline. Uh, and mm -hmm. so we operate on what are called continuing resolutions in the absence of a budget. Mm -hmm. But the big fight uh, will come about then okay. as we see how much money Congress is willing to allocate to research as opposed mm -hmm. to all the other pressing needs mm -hmm. that we face right now. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, I'm not too knowledgeable of the um, funding in the state. So how um, is there some kind of incentive coming back to open access to uh, for funders or do the funders say that open access should be mandatory or uh, open access has been mandatory at the largest funder, the NIH, National Institutes of Health, mm -hmm. since 2008. Okay. And in 2013, under Barack Obama, mm. uh, the largest two dozen oh. federal agencies were asked to adopt policies kind of like the NIH. They were not mm -hmm. asked to adopt policies exactly like the NIH, but similar, to require mm -hmm. open access. And it, okay. uh, they were supposed to have those policies mm -hmm. ready for inspection within one year. Uh, they did not do that, uh, but they did do it eventually. Mm -hmm. And so they're slow mm -hmm. in, uh, they were slow in being rolled out, but most of them have been rolled out. 
uh, they had to be approved by the White House, mm -hmm. and most of them were approved by the White House. That was still under Barack Obama. Mm -hmm. uh, even the ones that have been approved, okay. I would say, are still in the early days of implementation. Uh, and on the mm -hmm. whole, uh, unhappily, they didn't learn all the lessons that the NIH learned. For example, it's not enough just to say okay. that it's mandatory to deposit in a repository. You have to have sanctions for those who do not deposit. Mm -hmm. uh, it took the NIH several years to learn that, and the other agencies have not uh, taken the same lesson. Uh, but if you just look at the policies okay. by themselves, uh, about two mm -hmm. dozen of the largest federal research funding agencies now do have open access requirements uh, for the research that they fund. And when I say two mm -hmm. dozen, um, it's basically all the federal funding agencies that spend $100 million or more per year on research. So the only ones that are exempted are the smaller ones. <clears throat> okay. Mm hmm I see. No, I mean, this is like, a, I think, like, also in Europe, they're starting to get behind this. And, like, the European funding, as far as I know, uh, also requires uh, the um, published research That's to right. be open access uh, by yes. now. I think. And so <clears throat> there are several European yes. countries that have national open access policies mm -hmm. or national open access mandates. Uh, mm -hmm. They're all smaller than the U.S., of course. Uh, and that's one problem. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll never have a national uh, policy that way that covers uh -huh. every single one of our funders, or we mm -hmm. probably never will. Uh, but one reason is simply that we're so large. Uh, the NIH policy okay. uh, by itself spends more mm -hmm. money on research than all the public funders in UK put together. Uh, it spends oh, like five okay. times more than all of them put together. Uh, so that okay. gives you an idea of the size, and that's only one agency. It happens mm -hmm. to be the biggest of all of our agencies, but uh, mm -hmm. it's a good thing that it started first okay. because the big one went first, and it was easier for the smaller ones to follow. Mm -hmm. The smaller ones are now following. Yes, uh, It'll just take them a while to uh, adopt all the lessons mm -hmm. learned by the NIH. But in addition to those national because policies one of those... in Europe, there's Plan S. And mm -hmm. Plan S is picking up uh, mm -hmm. funders uh, in many European countries, but also outside Europe. And some of them are not the same as those mm -hmm. already covered by existing national policies. Uh, some of them are already covered, but their oh, okay. Plan S is stronger than the original mm -hmm. policy was. And some of the Plan S funders are okay. private and not public. Mm -hmm. okay. I mean, I, I think one of the, um, I mean, to be honest, the biggest changes I'm afraid will have to uh, be made by the funders because if they they can set the incentives to publish open access, I completely to agree. Make everything available. So I think if so, if the they can make the quickest change, I guess because uh, I have to admit I heard uh, some of your interviews um, from before, and. Um, Uh, you mentioned something that uh, this uh, change of becoming like, or to complete open science will require uh, quite a, a generational uh, shift or change before it will be more implemented. And I was hoping that actually if the funders were willing uh, for it, it might actually be quicker. Or what is your uh, view on this? Uh, you're completely right. I can put it in a slightly broader perspective. Uh, the people who really regulate the pace of change or the pace of open access are authors, mm -hmm. because authors decide mm -hmm. whether to submit their work to open access journals, whether to put copies in open mm -hmm. access repositories, and whether to transfer mm -hmm. their copyrights, and if so, on what terms. And so mm -hmm. uh, authors could do this overnight if they wanted yes. to, uh, if they true. were enlightened, if they all acted together. And of course, that's not going to happen, but they could. Mm -hmm. And so they're the key decision makers. So the next question is, mm -hmm. which institutions are in a position to influence author decisions? Mm -hmm. And there are two. Uh, two big ones, universities and funders. Mm -hmm. And between the two of them, funders have more power to influence author decisions than universities. Uh, it's hard for universities mm -hmm. to adopt strong mandates because that might trigger faculty resistance. Uh, yes. That's why the Harvard policy has this opt-out, even though uh, okay. the waiver rate is very mm -hmm. low. Uh, but the NIH policy has no opt-out. The NIH policy is also a rights retention policy. It says you must put your work in an open access repository You must mm -hmm. retain the rights necessary to make it open, and you must exercise those rights to make the work open. And if your publisher doesn't like that, you must seek another publisher, uh, period. No opt-out, mm -hmm. no waiver. Uh, and the uh, mm -hmm. position of the author is, if I don't like that, I have to seek my grant from somewhere else. And uh, very often mm -hmm. they don't want to, or they can't, or they've tried the others. So mm -hmm. when funders issue a well-written mandate, uh, it has far more power, it's far more effective 
then when universities do the same, even though it's better if they both do it. Yes. So no, I think true. funders hold the reins and they can make change overnight. I also think it's mm -hmm. important to remember that funders are basically charities. Uh, they're not for-profit corporations. If they're public mm -hmm. funders, they're government agencies mm -hmm. who are duty-bound mm -hmm. to act in the public interest. And if they're yes. private foundations, then they are literally charities. And either mm -hmm. way, uh, their goal is to pursue the public interest, not to uh, mm -hmm. seek revenue or profit or pay shareholders. So their yes. mission uh, you know, completely supports the idea of shifting over to requiring open access. It's just taking mm -hmm. them a long time to realize that. Uh, I think if funders... If funders are not already requiring open access, they're certainly thinking about it because they understand the logic of this. Ah, okay. Uh, that, that, that's good to hear. Uh, yeah, so, okay, maybe one last question to the future of uh, open open science and open access. So, uh, first of all, how long do you think this uh, whole transition will take? Like, do you think five or ten years? And then also um, how concerning more open data, I guess. Um Do you think it will be easier or not possible to get like a really big repositories with uh, good guidelines for open data soonish, or do you think this is still something that will take quite long till, uh, like, considering the open access it started like 20 years ago, roughly? Yep. Uh, let me do the second one first. Mm -hmm. uh, open data already exists. Open data policies already exist. Open data repositories already exist, and Open data, I think, is a messier problem than mm -hmm. open access to texts. Yes. And if open data is moving more slowly, that's the reason why. And the various okay. stakeholders have to sort out these complexities. Uh, you already know what they are, but, for example, mm -hmm. uh, research on human subjects often has data oh, yeah. that has mm -hmm. privacy problems, or you can't just share mm -hmm. it without uh, thinking mm -hmm. about uh, privacy issues. Uh, there's a timing issue. Many authors that completely support open access uh, want to be the first one to publish articles based on their data. And they don't want to share mm -hmm. their data before they have a chance to publish on it. Uh, yes. The last thing they want is to be scooped with their own data. Mm -hmm. And uh, some journals, uh, by the way, which I support, uh, have open data policies that say if you publish the text of an article in our journal, you must make the data open the same day, mm -hmm. the day of publication. Oh, okay. And some authors who are friendly to open are reluctant to do that because they don't want to publish just one article on their data. They want to publish five or 10 articles on their data mm -hmm. before they give it up. They're happy to give it up eventually, but they want mm -hmm. exclusivity uh, for a while mm -hmm. for a few articles. So that's author self-interest, even from people who support open. That's a mm -hmm. problem. Uh, another problem is yes. simply size. Data sets in astronomy or in mm -hmm. some aspects of uh, biology uh, are huge. And mm -hmm. some of the ones in astronomy are actually literally too big to share on the internet. Uh, you can mm -hmm. post them, but yes. you could never really download them uh, in real time because uh, it would take mm -hmm. days and weeks. So the best way to share them is uh, for the user to visit the website and run queries without downloading any data at all. Mm -hmm. But then you need a very sophisticated website that supports mm -hmm. uh, querying, kind of like Amazon. You've got to build that, mm -hmm. that kind of software. Uh, but another possibility, which Google tried once upon a time, is to ship the data sets on physical hard drives through the ordinary mail. Physical hard drive. <laughs> it, no matter how big the data set is, you can always ship it that way if you had to. And Google mm -hmm. had a cool program for a while that said it's willing to do that. It's willing to send anybody's data set anywhere, provided mm -hmm. uh, Google got to make a copy of it first. <laughs> okay. Oh, interesting. And if we're talking about research data, that's not a bad deal. You're trying to share it with the world, so why not share it with Google? Uh, anyway, Google, mm -hmm. for some reason, pulled the plug on that program. But if you've got mm -hmm. terabytes and terabytes of data, uh, the best way to share it with somebody else is just to send them a piece of hardware. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I and guess that's, that's true. Yeah. It's hard to reconcile with open access, or it's hard to make it open in the very same way that we make mm -hmm. data open. Yeah, on the other hand, that is true. Uh, data is somehow, sometimes in other respects, easier than open access to text. For example, uh, publishers never published mm -hmm. data. They only published text. So mm -hmm. if you make your data open, they're not losing anything. In fact, mm -hmm. if you're opening data that accompanies one of their articles, they're gaining something. Uh, they can claim, mm -hmm. uh, truthfully, that the article is more reproducible or that the readers benefit more from the article now with the accompanying data than they did before without the accompanying data. So many uh, closed publishers 
support open data. Mm -hmm. And they support it strongly. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's and then another related aspect is that most data sets are not copyrighted or copyrightable. And so there's nobody uh, mm. who's got a legal okay. basis to oppose the release of it, unless it's on some other ground like privacy. Oh, okay. I see. Interesting. And by the way, just back to policy, that's why most publisher, I'm sorry, most funder open data policies don't positively require open data. Instead, they require uh, data sharing plans. Uh, yes. And so mm -hmm. you tell the funder how you plan to share data with people who need it mm -hmm. or people who claim to need it. Uh, and your plan might be they have to sign a non-disclosure form or they have to prove that they work in this certain area. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I'll share it. But technically, a research sharing plan could be, I'm not going to share it with anybody. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that could comply with the funder's policy. Oh, okay. Uh, so if funders simply say, no, you must make it open, period, no matter what, then they run into all these mm -hmm. problems that I just mentioned. And okay. they know about the problems, and they don't want those problems, so they back up. I they see. have a softer okay. requirement. Hmm. Right. And concerning the future of uh, open access? Uh, that's really hard. I don't have a prediction about that. Uh, I'll just mm -hmm. observe that okay. you know, all the time I've been working on it, which is mm -hmm. roughly since the beginning of open access itself, uh, progress has been steadily upwards. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's not like the stock market. It doesn't go up and down and up and down. Mm -hmm. It's steadily upward. The slope of the curve is shallow compared to what we would like. Mm -hmm. uh, that means it's slow, but it's slow and steady okay. as opposed to slow and faltering. Yes. So I think it's not long before this slow and steady progress will reach some kind of tipping point. I don't like mm -hmm. the language of tipping points because it suggests that one day there'll be sudden change, but there really could be mm -hmm. sudden change. But even without sudden change, uh, there is this generational change, and I think a much larger percentage of young researchers today understand what open access is and understand its benefits and want it for themselves mm -hmm. than was true 10 years ago. Yes. And I think that'll be even more true uh, 10 years from now. And as I said before about authors, that's all it takes. Mm -hmm. uh, if authors want open access to their own work, they can get it. Mm -hmm. They can get it tomorrow uh, or they get it mm -hmm. for all their new work starting tomorrow. Yes. Uh, and so one of the key variables is author understanding, mm -hmm. uh, correct understanding as opposed to misunderstanding. Uh, there's a large number of options for making your work open, and it's really hard to know about all those options. Mm -hmm. For example, as we pointed out, uh, if you can't mm -hmm. easily publish in an open access journal, at least remember that there's repositories. Yes. Uh, many people do forget that. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you know all your options and if you want open access, you can get it for your future work starting tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And more and more uh, authors are educated about yes. their options, and they do want it. And I think that's mm -hmm. the most promising uh, uh, aspect of this. More universities are adopting policies. Mm -hmm. More funders are adopting policies. Mm -hmm. uh, more open access journals exist. More open access repositories exist. Mm -hmm. So while uh, authors and researchers are becoming better educated mm -hmm. about uh, their interests, we're also getting the infrastructure necessary to host it all. No, I completely agree. So mm -hmm. I'm still optimistic. Yes, uh, Thanks for that. Um, no, I, I mean, we're trying to do our best also like educating other people because as you said, I think this is the, the authors have the the power. They could decide if they wanted yep. to uh, go open access. That's maybe. right. All right. So uh, right. thanks a lot for the interview. I think it was really great uh, for us uh, to speak to you. I hope you also enjoyed it um, to some extent. I did. Thank you for your good questions. I appreciate them. No, and uh, yeah. And yeah, we'll be um, hoping that the future will be looking uh, be bright uh, on on this side. Yeah, and the the younger researchers today who want open access will be the journal editors and the journal publishers and the promotion and tenure committee members of tomorrow. Exactly. And that will make all the difference. Yes, I'm looking forward to this uh, future. Yes, me too. Thanks. Well, thanks for joining us, Dr. Suber. We really appreciated the interview. Okay, well, thank you, Nikolai and Srinath. So what do you think of that conversation? Ooh, it was really intense. I mean, I liked it a lot because the topic is, I think, very um, dear to me. And also it concerns myself and many other people that um, might want to go into academia. So having this conversation is very important, but also mm -hmm. difficult because it has like so many different facets that, it, that have nothing to do with your PhD project. So having to think about all of this at the same time is making it a bit difficult. I mean, of course, it, it tries to sort of open your eyes towards mm -hmm. the 
various facets that are associated with not just doing the science but also getting mm-hmm. the science out there and mm-hmm. communicating the science in a way that is accessible for everybody. And I think this is very important and this is something that everyone should be aware of as long as they're involved in the scientific field and scientific industry. Yes, I completely agree. It's like necessary nowadays to confront these issues that are in the uh, research system and the way that uh, the publishing works and the way that research evaluation works and also, mm-hmm. I guess, uh, acquiring money. So thinking about it is really going to be necessary in the future, even more so than now, I guess. Yes, and as he said, we are sort of in the prime with the right tools to become the future PIs and future yes. funders. <laughs> and well, uh, and editors. Exactly. You just desk reject everything. <laughs> yeah. So open access is the way forward. And I... even if it doesn't take a generational change, it definitely is going to take time so that it's globally adopted. Yes, definitely. But it will be nice when it happens. I mean, it might still be now. It should hopefully still be in our lifetimes. I would hope for that as well. Yes. <laughs> okay. Thanks all for listening to this uh, interview with uh, Dr. Peter Suber. And I hope you guys enjoyed this. And if you want to uh, look for more content and f- details of how to find them, you can find them in the uh, show notes below. And also, uh, if you have any questions concerning any of the topics, feel free to uh, write uh, either an email to me or to the Open Science Work Group of the PhDNet, and we will try to help you solve your issues or questions, because I think educating people, as you also discussed in the interview, is very important. Great. Very well articulated. The Offspring Magazine podcast is hosted by Srinath Ramkumar and Nikolai Horman. It's produced by the PhD Networking Group on Science Communication called The Offspring Magazine and produced by the Max Planck PhD Network. If you would like to get in touch with us, please feel free to write to us at offspring.podcasts at phdnet.mpg.de. The intro and outro tunes were composed by Srinath Ramkumar and the pre-intro jingle was composed by Gustavo Carrizo. Please feel free to check out the Offspring blog on the Max Planck PhD Net website as we have many interesting articles coming up along the lines of the Open Science Awareness Initiative. We'll be back with you next week with another exciting episode. Until then, it's a bye from me and a bye from Nico. Bye.